In this video, I'll be tackling a subject that everyone finds mysterious, quantum mechanics. The title on this slide, what the heck is quantum mechanics, is a pretty fair question. Quantum mechanics is one of the most important theories in all of physics, but it's also famously hard to understand, especially from a textbook. I'll be going over the core postulates of quantum mechanics, using minimal math and focusing on pictures and concepts. These postulates come straight from one of the classic books in the field, by Claude Cohen Tanucci, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1997. As far as quantum mechanics books goes, it's great. But let's be honest, that's a bit like saying it's the clearest book on how to rewire the entire electrical system of a jet engine. The subject itself is so intricate that even the best books can be overwhelming. This video is my attempt to strip away that confusion. I'll break down what the postulates really mean, turn the weirdness into visual ideas, and build a foundation that you can actually understand. If you have some math or physics background, that will definitely help, but this is meant for anyone who's curious and willing to think a little bit differently. I love this meme because it's true. The thousandth time you read about quantum mechanics, you often feel just as confused as the first time. But this talk is designed to give you a clear framework so each time you revisit the topic, it will start to make more sense. Before we discuss quantum mechanics, I want to address the question, what is classical mechanics? Classical mechanics is the framework we use to describe how objects move when forces act on them. It applies to both conservative systems where energy is conserved and non-conservative systems where forces like friction cause energy loss. In quantum mechanics, we almost always deal with conservative systems. That's why in this presentation, I'll focus on conservative systems. In these systems, if you know the position and momentum of a particle at one moment in time, and you know the conservative forces acting on it, you you can predict its future with certainty. These predictive powers come from Newton's laws of motion or equivalently from Hamiltonian mechanics, which uses energy functions to describe motion. If you're not familiar with Hamiltonian mechanics or even Newton's laws, that's fine. The key idea is this. These equations let you predict a particle's motion for all future times, as long as you know its initial position, momentum, and the forces acting on it. In this Colorado FET projectile applet, I'll set this angle to 30 degrees, we'll have the speed of the cannonball when it leaves the cannon be 15 meters per second and the trajectory of this cannonball is known even before the cannonball leaves the cannon. That is classical mechanics in a nutshell. This is an applet I created which has a ball inside of a box. The ball starts with a defined position. In this case, it's 0.4 meters from the left side of the box. The ball also starts with a defined momentum. I can change the momentum and I'll give it an initial momentum of 3.66 kilograms meters per second. The ball simply bounces between the walls without losing energy. Knowing the initial state and the box size, I can calculate its position at any future time. Even complex paths, like the Mars rover trip from Earth to Mars, are designed this way. Once we know the initial momentum and engine thrust, classical mechanics lets us plan the full trip before launch. The title of this slide is Postulates of Quantum Mechanics. To begin, let's discuss what a postulate is. A postulate is a foundational statement or axiom that defines the framework of a physical theory. Think of a postulate as the rules you accept at the beginning. It's like saying, let's agree on how the game works, and then everything follows from there. For example, in Newtonian mechanics, the postulates of the theory are essentially Newton's three laws of motion, or Hamiltonian mechanics, which are the same as Newton's laws in a different, more generalized language. These laws form the foundational assumption of classical mechanics. In this presentation, I'm going to walk you through the postulates of quantum mechanics as they are written in textbooks, but I'll also rewrite them in simpler terms and explain each one in my own words. Here's the first postulate of quantum mechanics taken directly from the book by Claude Cohen and Tanucci. At a specific time t0, the state of a physical system is described by a cat psi of t0, which belongs to a state space v. If you've never studied quantum mechanics before, does this help you? Probably not. My goal here is to show you what quantum mechanics is really saying without bearing you in math. So think of this as a big picture guide, something that makes the core ideas finally click. Here's my own version of the first postulate of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is confusing, and this still might make as much sense as putting a raincoat on your goldfish. But don't worry. The pictures and animations on the next slide will make it click. Quantum mechanics study systems made of incredibly small particles, like electrons in an atom. These particles are far too small to see. Each system is described by a complex number at every point in space. If you're not familiar with complex numbers, think of them as arrows with direction and length. That's what a complex number is. There are strict mathematical rules about which set of complex numbers are allowed. A valid set of complex numbers forms what we call a wave function. 
and the wave function contains all the information about the system. A combination of wave functions is also an allowed wave function. These are not part of the first postulate, but because animations are coming, I included this for extra context. Each complex number rotates over time and can change in length. The squared length represents the probability of finding the particle at that location. And again, only certain sets of complex numbers are allowed. Okay, I know that was a lot to take in, but believe it or not, this strange sounding set of rules is actually the framework for all of quantum mechanics. Once you see the visuals, you'll start to see how all these pieces fit together. And remember, even students who take an entire college course on quantum mechanics struggle with what it's really saying in part because it's so strange, and in part because the class does not give the introductory lesson I'm about to give you. The next few slides will make it much more tangible. In this applet, the bottom shows a classical ball bouncing in a box, while the top shows a tiny particle confined to a box, like an electron in an atom or a quark in a proton. The comparison helps visualize how differently quantum particles behave. We can't see electrons directly, but experiments confirm they don't move like tiny balls. I pause time. This slider labeled N sets the energy level. In quantum mechanics, energy isn't continuous. It comes in discrete steps, even if those steps are very small. Instead of tracking one ball, the quantum description assigns a complex number to every point in the box. These numbers rotate in time and their square length gives the probability of finding the particle there. For this example, the lengths stay fixed. I'll explain later how the allowed wave functions are determined, but the key idea is that quantum mechanics doesn't just tell you where the particle is. It gives you a wave-like picture of all possible locations at once. Now I wanna show you some of the possible wave functions for this tiny electron in a very small box. If I start with n equals one, that's the lowest energy state, and I'll start it, and classically, that would mean there'd be a classical ball bouncing back and forth and it's moving slowly. Pause the animation and this is the wave function corresponding to the lowest energy level of an electron in a tiny box. There are complex numbers at each location in space and the length of the complex number is related to the probability of finding the particle there. So there'd be a very small chance that you'd find the particle at this location and here where the complex number is biggest, where the arrow is the largest, that's where there'd be a largest probability. And this would be one possible wave function for this specific example. I can change the energy state and I'll increase the n value from n equals one to n equals three. And now I'll start the animation, and classically the ball has more energy, so it's gonna be moving quicker than it was before, and the electron is gonna have a different wave function. This is another allowed wave function for this system. There's a complex number at each point within the box that we're looking at, and we'd have a large probability of finding the electron here, and a small probability of finding it here, and a relatively large probability of finding it right at the center, but a small probability here. And this is another one of the allowed wave functions for the system. Now let's increase n to seven and we'll start. And you can see that the classically the ball would be moving much quicker. Pause the animation. This is the wave function corresponding to n equals seven. You'd have a high probability of finding the electron here and a small probability of finding it here. This is what a wave function is. It's a complex number at each point within the system that you're looking at. It gives you information about the system. One of the things it tells you is how likely it is for you to find the particle at a given location. AcePhysics.org, math and physics tutoring with Dr. Hudis. The point of this applet is to show that a wave function can be the sum of any allowed wave function. On the top row, I'll choose one allowed wave function. We'll pick n equals to one. In the second row, I'll pick another allowed wave function. Let's set n equal to three. Here I've chosen two different wave functions, each with its own configuration of complex numbers rotating in space. They rotate at different speeds. The resulting wave function shown on the bottom is their weighted sum. Because it's the sum of two allowed wave functions, it's also allowed. Notice how the lengths of the arrows on the bottom change with time at each location. This means that the probability of finding the particle at different places is constantly shifting. One last note. I've split the box into 10 points for simplicity, but in reality, there are nearly an infinite number of points in space, each with its own complex number. Now let's look at one of the most important wave functions in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the atomic orbitals. These wave functions describe how electrons behave inside atoms. 
They explain the structure of the periodic table and are a major focus of advanced quantum mechanics. In classical physics, we study orbits of planets moving around stars, often elliptical in shape. But in quantum mechanics, electrons bound to atomic nuclei are described by complex numbers at every point in the tiny volume of the atom. These numbers have both magnitude and direction and form intricate patterns determined by the system's properties. It would be ideal if we could actually see these complex numbers rotating in three-dimensional space. But since that's hard to visualize on a flat screen, we use these kind of simplified models. A science museum or virtual reality display could do so much better. Imagine a 3D rotating visualization where you can not only see the complex arrows at every point in space, but also add wave functions together in real time. That would make quantum mechanics intuitive and accessible. Come on, people, let's put this together. We need these to be 3D models in order to actually see this. Even some professors get tripped up by this topic, thinking the complex numbers only exist in an abstract Hilbert space. In truth, the wave function lives in both real space and Hilbert space. The values are assigned to points in physical space, while Hilbert space gives the structure and rules for how they evolve and combine. For any given wave function in this picture, each point in space has a complex number. Surfaces are drawn through points where the arrow has the same magnitude. Locations where there's no surface have no complex numbers, meaning zero probability of finding the electron there. Larger surfaces enclose more points, so the probability of finding the electron in those regions is higher. The top row shows a simple wave function, where all the complex numbers have the same magnitude and they have the same phase. In this picture, the color represents the direction or phase of the complex number. For this wave function, all the complex numbers have the same value on a given surface, the same magnitude, and they all point in the same direction. Red represents 0 degrees, yellow is 90 degrees, green is 180 degrees, and blue is 270 degrees. As time evolves, the arrows rotate continuously, and the color of this wave function would cycle accordingly. So the combined shape, size, and color of the surface captures both the probability and phase of the electron's wave function. On this slide, I will discuss the second postulate of quantum mechanics, and on the next slide, I will show some animations to help you understand it better. Here's the second postulate of quantum mechanics taken from a textbook. Every measurable physical quantity is described by an operator A that acts on the wave function in the state space V. The operator is called an observable. Here's some more information you can read directly from the textbook. Now I'll explain the second postulate in my own words, and I'll show you an animation on the next slide. The wave function contains all the information about the quantum system. We can measure two main things, position, where the particle might be. The probability is the highest where the wave function's magnitude is the largest. That's where the complex number has the largest length. And momentum, which is related to the wave function's wavelength. A wave function is a superposition of many positions or many wavelengths. This is talking about the Fourier series, if you're familiar with that mathematics. In three dimensions, a wave can have different wavelengths in the x, y, and z direction, or in r, theta, and phi if you're using spherical coordinates. Each measurable quantity, called an observable, is represented by a mathematical operator that acts on the wave function. So there are mathematical operations like a derivative that you can do on a wave function, and mathematically that will tell you the wavelength. This applet helps explain the second postulate of quantum mechanics by showing an electron confined in a small box. The top row shows one allowed wave function of the system. The middle row shows a second allowed wave function. The bottom row is a combination of the two because quantum mechanics allows superposition. This combined wave function is also allowed. If the system is in the bottom row wave function, it's in two possible momentum states at once, a combination of two wavelengths. When you measure its momentum, you'll get one of the allowed momentum states. At that point, the system collapses into that state. Here's the confusing part. Once it's in a single momentum state, a single wavelength, it's actually spread out over many possible positions. If you now measure its position, the wave function will collapse into a single position, but you won't know which one until you measure it. The reverse is also true. A single position, like this one here, is actually a combination of every possible momentum state. This is one of the central ideas of quantum mechanics. It's subtle and it takes time to get used to. I have a playlist on the mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics. I discuss these advanced ideas in these videos particularly quantum mechanics math 2c. These are difficult concepts and these videos require prior knowledge. And now let's discuss the third postulate of quantum mechanics. The textbook definition is as follows. When the physical quantity is measured on a system in the normalized state psi, the probability p of obtaining the non-degenerate eigenvalue of the observable is given by the inner product of the bra with a ket magnitude squared. The quantity that you're measuring, like the position or the momentum, is the normalized eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue of the observable. Observed quantity. Hmm. I'm going to explain
explain this on the next slide with an example. On this slide, I have an example and a picture to help explain the third postulate of quantum mechanics. This square-like wave function is a weighted sum of these five waves, each with a different wavelength. Because wavelength is directly related to momentum, if you measure the momentum of this wave function, you will always get one of five possible momentum values corresponding to these five wavelengths. The probability of obtaining a particular momentum is determined by the amplitude of the corresponding sine wave. In this example, the longest wavelength, smallest momentum, has the highest probability and the shortest wavelength has the lowest probability. However, it's important to remember that in general, amplitude and wavelength are not correlated. This just happens to be the case in this example. On this slide, I have an example of a two-dimensional wave function that has two different wavelengths, one in the x direction and one in the y direction. In quantum mechanics, this means the particle has two independent momentum components. Now we're under the fourth postulate of quantum mechanics. Here's the textbook explanation, and here's the fourth postulate in my own words. I'll start reading here. When you measure a quantum system, the wave function collapses into one specific state that matches the measurement result. Which state it collapses into is probabilistic, and the probabilities come from the original wave function. After the measurement, the system is in a single state. From that point on, the wave function can change and evolve over time. But the measurement result itself is all the information we know at that instant. The fifth and final postulate of quantum mechanics says the time evolution of the state vector, or the wave function, is governed by the Schrodinger equation. This is the Schrodinger equation, a simple wave equation. In my own words, the fifth postulate says each allowed wave function has a characteristic wavelength. If we imagine the wave function as a complex number at every point, shorter wavelengths cause the phase of these complex numbers to rotate more quickly. Back to the example of an electron in a tiny box. The top wavelength is a low energy, n equal to 1, and the middle wavelength is a much higher energy, n equals to 7. As you can see, the complex numbers in the middle rotate much more quickly than those on top. This is a higher energy state, and the Schrodinger equation tells us the complex numbers rotate more quickly with higher energy. AcePhysics.org Math and Physics Tutoring with Dr. Hudis.